Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, November the 16th, 2022. It is currently 3.09 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. Well, I hope you're ready because we are about to look at Law and Gospel Part 27. This is the 27th episode in our series on understanding law and gospel. We are working on looking at 25 theses about law and gospel and the proper distinction between the two. So we're still working on that. And if you would like to see those 25 theses, all you have to do is you go to our series on the Church One app, Understanding Law and Gospel, Look for the one that's entitled Law and Gospel PDF, and right there attached to that episode is the PDF with the 25 Theses on a proper understanding of law and gospel. Please take advantage of that, well, material. Take advantage of that uh, supplemental material to add to to, uh, our ongoing discussion. But please do that. Again, that's the Church One app. All you have to do is go to the Android store, or the Google Play Store, I should say, or the Apple App Store, and do a search for Church One. That's Church O-N-E, Church O-N-E. Download the app. Once the app is downloaded, do a search for us, Theology Central. Choose us as your chosen broadcaster. That basically turns the Church One app into the Theology Central app. And then look for the series, Understanding Law and Gospel, scroll down, and you will see it, uh, you will see it after, right after, uh, right before part seven. Well, if you're scrolling down, it'll be right after part seven, and it will say Law and Gospel PDF. You click on that, and you'll look carefully, you'll see, like I'm I'm, I'm clicking on it, you'll see uh, View PDF Text, and then you'll see the 25 theses on the proper distinction between law and gospel. Please take advantage of that. Uh, And we're going to be adding more PDFs in the future. I just got to think of like when I come up with an idea for one, um, someone uh, someone I think can can definitely help me out who helped create that. And uh, we're going to try to utilize that feature more often. All right. Are you ready? Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Now, the goal was tonight, I'd be standing behind the pulpit at Victory Baptist Church, and we would be looking, working on the 25 Theses, and we would be moving on and continuing our work there. But that's not going to work out exactly that way tonight. So what I thought I would do is still do something in our series, Law and Gospel, by returning to our sermon review, because we're reviewing the sermons preached at a conference on Law and Gospel. We're up to part four of the, of the sermons preached at that conference, and we're going to review it, analyze it critique it, use it as uh, just a a launching pad for our own conversations and discussions, and hopefully it will prove to be beneficial and helpful. Because you're hearing my critique of a conference on law and gospel, the things we agree with, the things we disagree with, and I think that's giving you extra, uh, giving you an extra perspective to consider, and hopefully you're greatly benefiting from it. People have had lots of questions on this subject. Um, I, I am very pleased by how many people have been engaged in this and how many people have said they've never heard any teaching on it. So if they've never heard any teaching on it and I can provide some of that teaching and and provide a discussion that really sparks much thought, consideration, people will really, 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 really give this serious thought, then I've accomplished something no matter how many mistakes I may make or whatever else may go wrong, all right? But are you ready? Here we go. We return to a conference that happened in 2022. They are talking about law and gospel. This is part four. They just call it law and gospel part four, so I don't have any unique title. And uh, we've enjoyed this so uh, so far. There's been much that I've agreed with. There's been a lot that I've like, wait, what? I don't quite understand. I mean, in fact, I, I felt at times it's almost like, hey, here's this concept of law and gospel, and then almost in a way go against what I think law and gospel should lead to, but we won't go back and review all of that. So I think that's everything you need to know. If you have any questions, you can always email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Dot com. If you're listening live via the Spreaker app, feel free to jump into the chat. If you're listening in on our Discord channel, I will try to check the Discord channel. So if you want to post there, you can as well. Here we go.
people were here last night? The majority? Okay, great. And you came back. Thank you. All right. Good, good. Uh, and I, I hope you're... Oh, I need my different glasses. I hope you're signed up for the uh, Ian Hamilton conference. Doesn't that sound good? If you're here at the church, you probably know about it. If you're not, uh, I think he'll be here when? In just a couple weeks? And so you guys get all the good speakers. You had Carl Truman here last year, and what, Beaky was here, Peter Sammons. That's exciting. Okay, let's do that. All right. So these are the readers, these are the preachers. Reminds me of that funny story. Uh, I, had, I was at Grace Church, and there was a man preaching, and... It was W.A. Criswell. He was a famous Southern Baptist preacher in Texas. Anybody remember that name, Criswell? Yeah, and uh, he was preaching at Grace Church, and he had his Bible, and he said, and if you don't believe this, then you might as well just throw it away. And he threw his Bible, and you could just see it flutter. (laughs) And uh, he had gone out to lunch later that day with the MacArthur family, and I think it was Mark MacArthur, the son, said, you know, Dr. Criswell, you know, you threw your Bible and all that stuff. What's, you know, how does that work? And he said, oh, son, don't worry about that. This is my preaching Bible, and this is my throwing Bible. (laughs) 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 So I only have one Bible here today. This is my preaching Bible, and if you're not going to fall asleep, it won't be the throwing Bible. I, I'm, my wife is raised kind of Plymouth Brethren, and she was taught not to put anything on top of your Bible at home. So anybody kind of been influenced by that? And sometimes I think, oh yeah, just Bible's on top. So I, I wonder if I wonder. I mean, that's a funny story about uh, Criswell. I did get to see uh, Criswell preach uh, uh, once or twice, a couple of times, um, and in Dallas uh, when I was a teenager. So I was a brand new Christian, didn't know his significance or anything. I just knew this is some older guy preaching. Um, I didn't know it's, you know, Criswell, you know, like anything, you know, I I didn't know that some people spoke of him in hushed tones or anything, but that is a funny story. But I do find it interesting. uh, Some people have, now I don't want to get distracted. I don't want to get distracted here because so that's one of the reasons I love listening to preaching and love listening to Christian podcasts is because like every minute I can stop it and and it's really just its own topic that I could just I could turn on my microphone and talk an hour about. But I, it would be interesting. All the and I, and I know some people are getting ready to get offended, but I'm going to say this: I think some people have superstitions in regards to the the physical Bible. I have met people. Who like if you underline, mark, highlight, you know, write notes on the, on the margins, people will like, oh, you're desecrating the word of God. How dare you do that? And and, and it's typically the older generation who like they don't believe you should mark in it or anything. And I've always found that like that fascinating, right? I've never heard that you can't put something on top of the Bible. I mean, I have well. I just looked down. Okay, I just looked down. I didn't even realize it. Okay, I have the, I have the four volumes of the the liturgy of the hours. Right, the four volume set. Those are beautiful books. I do need to find a different setup here. But I have the four volumes of the liturgy of the hour, and on top of that, I have a Bible, and then on top of the Bible, I have my microphone. <laughs> so literally, my microphone is sitting on top of the Bible. So I guess some people would believe that is. Uh, I, I I just think that that's um. I understand you want to honor and respect it. I think, see if this makes sense to you. I think we have a tendency to try to show honor and respect through external things that really don't amount to much, right? Like we can try, like, I'm not going to place anything on top of my Bible. I'm not going to, how dare you throw the Bible? Like we can, we can, we can avoid certain actions or do certain actions to supposedly show honor and respect. But in many cases, it's nothing more than external symbolism without inward reality. If you really want to show respect and honor to the word of God, then you read it you meditate on it, you study it, you memorize it, you share it, you think about it, you cherish it, you desire it, you love it. I don't think just little 
external things like I don't, I'm not going to say anything on top of it, or I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do. I think that just becomes mere symbolism. It, it doesn't really amount to anything. I, I, I think there's a, a lot of times. I, 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 you may know this story. You may not know this story. I, I was in the United States military, and I had planned to work work it out so that I would get out at the ten year mark. And the plan was I was going to get out at the ten year mark. In the, from the United States Air Force, and I was going to transition right from that to being basically the associate pastor at a church in Bellevue, Nebraska. Everything was ready. That was the plan. That was kind of how everything was going to work out. I, I was hoping it was going to be great. It was going to be wonderful. It was going to be, I, re- I really thought, I really thought that it was all going to work out. I was excited. You know, I'd already, I'd already grad- graduated from a Bible Institute. I'd been ordained. All the, I think I was getting ready to graduate from a second school or maybe a third school. I, I, I mean, everything was going good. I thought the ministry is in my immediate future, right? Well, it was Pastor Appreciation Night. <laughs> pastor Appreciation Night, Right. So I get asked to preach a sermon. Now, I'm told, hey, it's Pastor Appreciation Night. Now, we've got a big fellowship, potluck, all of this stuff planned. So we need you to cut the sermon short. Isn't it amazing that whenever churches need to do something, what do we cut short? What's the right answer, class? It's always the preaching of God's word, right? It's always the, hey, 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 don't do this to your Bible. Don't do this to your Bible. But we got no problem cutting the preaching of it uh, short if we have, you know, food to eat. Okay, so already I get irritated because that stuff just drives me crazy. It's like, we'll cut something else out. I I know what, let's cut out the potluck. How about we do that and just focus on the preaching of God's word? Because the last time I thought that there was a church and not a golden corral or a restaurant. Okay, but, but I digress. I digress. I know people are going to like, you're such a jerk. But it's just that stuff just drives me crazy. As Paul told the Corinthians, don't you have homes to eat in? I mean, the church, I come to feed upon God's word. I don't need you to give me fried chicken. I, I, I can do that at home. All right, but I digress. So I'm like, pastor appreciation, pastor appreciation. So here's how it's going to work. Uh, the pastor, we're going to, someone's going to preach for him, say so he doesn't have to pre- prepare a sermon. And then we're all going to go downstairs. Everybody's going to hand him a card, probably give him a gift card, maybe some other kind of gift, maybe a financial gift. Everybody's going to say, you're wonderful. You're amazing. You're great. We're all going to sit around, eat some food, talk about the weather. And we're like, we showed our appreciation to the pastor. And so I was thinking about, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go after this a different way. So I... <laughs> stood behind the pulpit, and I just, let's just say I did not hold back. I called out the whole, what I called fake pastor appreciation. I'm like, if you really want to show appreciation to your pastor, here's a novel idea. On Sunday morning, there's like 400 of us here, but on Sunday night, we can't even get 100. And then on Wednesday, there's like 20 people. In fact, we don't even meet in the sanctuary. We meet downstairs in a semicircle because there's so few people. If you want to show appreciation, how about you show up? Oh, here's a novel idea. You want to appreciate your pastor? How many of you walk in here and you're not even carrying a Bible? You're not carrying a notebook because you don't really care about what's being preached. If you really want to show appreciation to your pastor, show up with a Bible, take some notes and care. Right, that, so yeah, that's, that, that's just a taste of what happened. Well, let's just say that was the end of my ministerial career before it even got started because I ticked off the entire church. Everyone was furious. And there was no way I was going to ever be be able to be the associate pastor there. And that ended everything. So I had to stay in the military, uh, well, for another nine years until I got medically retired because of what happened to me. And, you know, I won't go through all that. Medically discharged, 100% disabled, and I won't go through everything that happened. A long, boring story. But, um, yes. So I, I just think sometimes it's like we just like the we, – we like a lot of symbolism, you know? It's like, you know, you know stand, honor the word of God. Okay, well, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but sometimes it's just meaningless gestures instead of something real, instead of something meaningful. So I, I don't know. It's just, it's just interesting he mentioned, because like, I call those kind of superstitions. Don't throw your Bible. Don't put anything on top of your Bible. Don't mark in your Bible. Don't do this. Don't do that. How about, how about instead of telling us what not to do with it, we show our honor and respect by reading it, reverencing it, caring enough to understand it, trying to figure it out, trying to memorize it, trying to show that it's truly something we treasure. 
than these just meaning meaningless gestures. So I know this. If you ever if you ever get the opportunity to preach for a pastor appreciation message, just say, our pastor is wonderful. He preaches the word of God. We are so lucky to have him. Just give it a nice, simple, easy message. Get everyone out on time so that everyone can go downstairs and go through the empty gestures. And then, because uh, the one thing I've learned as a pastor is everyone will tell you how much they love you until they disagree with you. And then they walk right out and they don't care what it does to you. They don't care what it does to your ministry. They don't care. So, yeah. Even after they told you you're the greatest thing in the world, you're the greatest thing in the world until you disagree with them. And then you're no longer the greatest thing in the world. You're just yesterday's trash. That's okay. All right, there you go. So, all right, that's that's the conclusion of our discussion on law and gospel. But it has to be talked about because I think that there's real issues. I think there's really something. It's that don't it's like the I don't honor God with your lips when your heart is far from him, right? Jesus spoke against that. Don't sometimes we just we like empty gestures and, and meaningless symbolism instead of anything of real substance. But we're all guilty of it because we're all sinners, but Let's let's see what the discussion in this episode is about law and gospel because that's what we're really here to listen to and to analyze. Well, my name is Mike Abendroth, and we're doing a conference on law and gospel. And today we'll probably have some review from yesterday. Uh, I'll try to give us a little time for some Q&A as well. If you're very focused on following the schedule exactly, we're going to change that up some. Uh, why don't we... Pray, but before we pray, I just want to read something to you from the scriptures that will hopefully set our minds properly. Then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might, forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Bow with me, please. Father in heaven, we're thankful for what you've done for us. In eternity, you chose us, and we're thankful for that. We praise you that before we did anything, that before we did one holy thing, one sinful thing, uh, you chose us, and we're thankful that you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless. We're thankful that you sent the Lord Jesus to redeem us from all our sins, uh, to think about the Son of God uh, that you loved, uh, that was always pleasing to you, uh, that you would punish him in our place. Uh, thank, we're thankful for that. And we're thankful that the Holy Spirit, that he applied uh, wonderfully the work of the Son that you sent. And now we're redeemed, we're seated. One of those, <laughs> it's one of those things about uh, prayer. I, I've, I've talked about this so many times. I, look, every time I listen to a sermon, I have some of the same thoughts. And it's my own, it's, and I say these things because I struggle with many of these same concepts. See, he's praying, he's supposed to be talking to God, but it sounds like he's just kind of giving a mini summary of, well, the doctrine of salvation, right? Justification, (laughs) sanctification, the Holy Spirit. It just sounds like he's just giving like a mini theology lesson. You're praying to God. God doesn't need a theology lesson, right? So like, like, so, so, so many times in, in, in church, the the pastor, you're, you're, there almost needs to be a designated person to pray. Because when the pastor prays before his sermon, he almost gives a preview of the sermon. And then when he prays at the end of the sermon, he basically reviews his sermon. Because, I mean, and you can't blame a pastor for doing that because you're getting ready to preach. So your mind is focused on the sermon. So you just happen to start kind of just preaching your outline. And then when you just finished preaching, your mind is thinking about what you just said or what you forgot to say or what you feel like wasn't emphasized enough. So you just immediately in your prayer, you start emphasizing it. But you're supposed to be talking to God. You're not talking to the people. And it's so easy to do that. I, oh, it, it makes me so mad when I, uh, uh, sometimes I try just not even to pray at the end. Um, I just, I'm just like, you know, the, the end. Um, 
Yeah, okay, someone just said, I do the same thing when praying with my kids. I have to check myself uh, on that often. I know it's so, it's so maddening because I'm supposed to be talking to God. It's like, I'm not supposed to be giving a theology lesson. I'm not supposed to be preaching. I'm not, I, I'm supposed to just be talking to God. That's it. That's all I'm supposed to be doing. If, if prayer is communication with God, it needs to be open, honest communication with God, right? What I would love is to be able to stand in the pulpit and say, all right, uh, before we start, we're going to pray. Lord, you know, I am sick and tired of some of the people in this church. And Lord, you know, I'm frustrated today. I got in a fight with someone on the way here. Someone cut me off in traffic. I'm tired. I'm irritated. I want this sermon to be over. I don't even want to come back tonight. I, like, I, w- I, w- I, wish, I wish we could do that. I w- hey, Lord, you know what I was thinking last night. These people don't, but you do. But, but if you were to pray like that, people would be like, oh, what is happening? What is going on? Everyone, cover their ears. Shh. But wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be more real? Like I'm having a real conversation with God. But no, I'm just supposed to give some like, here's your template. Here's what you're supposed to pray. Here you go. All right. It's like you just grab out the piece of paper. All right. See, prayer before the sermon. Lord, uh, hide me behind your cross so they don't see me. They only hear from you. Let my words be your words. Let my words bring you glory and not any to me or, or something like that. And it's just like, do we just supposed to just read it? Like we condemn Catholics for having printed prayers, you know, prayers that you read on a particular day, you know, the, the prayer you start at the beginning and mass and, and all the, the standardized prayers, they get condemned for that. But we fall into the same trap with playing, just praying the template. Is there honest communication with God from the pulpit in prayer? Is there honest communication with God during prayer time in church? And I and I know that you that there's it's got to be I understand that there's an appropriate time. It just just sometimes when I listen to a pastor pr- uh, pray, I'm like, oh, okay, so I, I I can just start taking notes during the prayer because he's giving me his outline now, right? He's giving me what he wants me to know now. So I don't know. It may not bother anybody else. It bothers me because I know I'm guilty of it so many times, so many times, and I get mad at myself. All right, here we go. Yield. We are guaranteed a future salvation uh, with you, and we're thankful for that. I pray for these dear people today at the church that you would give them encouragement, uh, that you'd give them conviction as needed, uh, that they would think of these categories properly. And when we learn about evangelism with law gospel, would you give them, would you give me even this week, someone to give the good news to? And we're thankful that when it comes to parenting, we see law gospel paradigms. Would you help us to be good parents and not? I mean, who prayed that even in parenting, we see law gospel paradigms like, is that a prayer or is that a part of the message? Is it like, see, I mean, I I don't, I don't know. Is that a prayer? (laughs) Hey, Lord, I'm thankful that even in parenting, we see law gospel paradigm. I don't think that's how I would talk to God. I, I don't know. Just. Uh, drill sergeants. When it comes to our marriages, the same thing. Father, would you help us? We, we are needy, we're weak, and without you, we can do nothing. And so would you bless our time this morning? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, yesterday, we basically went over some terms, law and gospel. And theologically and historically, in the context of theology, law is simply something that we do, and gospel is something that's done Uh, Generally speaking, law could be any kind of instruction, uh, the Torah in the Old Testament, but strictly speaking, we are talking about law as uh, the Creator giving us charges because He is the Creator and He can tell us what to do for His glory, for our good, for the good of others, etc. So that was to do law, right? The two great commandments, law, the Ten Commandments, law. And then we were talking about the gospel, and generally speaking, the gospel could be the New Testament, as Calvin might call it. It could be, generally speaking, the gospel of Mark, the good news just in general, according uh, to Mark. By the way, whenever I say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I try to expand it to make it better. We could say Mark, and you know what I'm saying. I could say the gospel of Mark, but I like to say better the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark. I just think that's better, you know, and all the truncated things that we say. I won't correct you, by the way, if I hear you say Mark. At least I won't correct you 
with my voice, but in my mind I might do a correct. It's because sometimes it's hard to be a Christian, right? Because we have to do all this theological autocorrect all the time. Well, I meant to say this and, you know, confirm that. And, and then, strictly speaking, gospel is good news about the Lord Jesus. And, and I said before that it is a Trinitarian concept to think about the gospel because when you think of the Son who was sent, right? And for God so loved the world, he gave. And so he's sending. He's a sending father, a giving father. And then the son, of course. And you think about eternity past in the covenant of redemption, the father and the son and the spirit all together because they're co-equal. They have the same nature and essence and, and one will, and they decide to send the son. And so the son is sent. Uh, the spirit of God uh, certainly uh, assists the Lord Jesus on the earth and then applies his, his merits to us and and redeem, redeems us and regenerates us. But we think to ourselves, all right, we're focused on the Son many times, but when we think of the Son, I want you to think the Father sends and then the Spirit applies or the Spirit attends, right? So every time you think of the Father, you think of the Son and then you think of the Spirit. And so I just don't want you, I want you to know here at this church, especially where we value the doctrine of God, right? Do you value the doctrine of God here? Does, does Meister and Pastor Rob think about the doctrine of God well? Yes, but I don't want you to think this is not a Trinitarian thing when I'm talking about the gospel because... Okay, I'm, I'm not in any way dismissing what he's talking about here, but I just want to make sure it's very clear in case anyone new is listening. Law is where God tells you what to do. Gospel is when the Bible records what Christ has done. He, he, he wanted to get into a discussion about the word gospel and all of its different ways that it's used. But when we're talking about law and gospel and the proper distinction, law is do this, do this, do this, do this. Gospel, it has been done. Christ has done it, is doing it, will do it. Any, in any tense, that's what God is doing, what Christ is do, doing or has done for us. Law is you do this. Gospel, it has been done or it will be done for you. All right, that's, that's the way to understand it in this context of law and gospel. When I think of the Father, I am thinking of the Son and thinking about the Spirit. So we talked basically law, gospel. Then we talked about kinds of law, remember? Uh, kinds of law would be civil, ceremonial, moral. But that was not really my wheelhouse last night. It was more how the law is used. And I want to talk about that a little bit more today, how the law is used because God's nature is holy and unchanging, therefore God's law is unchanging and holy, but our relationship to the lawgiver changes. And just to whet your appetite a little bit, my wife and I, like you probably, are always looking for shows to watch on TV, but you can never find anything good, right? Like, I can't find anything good, so lots of times we end up watching MasterChef. And... For those of you that laughed, you know, you're a pagan like I am, and we're watching MasterChef, and I'm not a very good cook, but I appreciate good food, and I'm thinking, man, this is amazing what they can do. And so you can imagine Gordon Ramsay, and he's the main guy, and he's pretty aggressive, and you want to make him the right kind of food, right, or you're going to be in big trouble. I can just see that lady who did the wrong thing, and he cut the bagel in half and put the bagel on the side of the head looking like Princess Leia, and he said, what are you? And she said, I don't know. And he said, you're an idiot sandwich. I'm like, oh. I go, oh. <clears throat> So when I was a kid growing up, we had these little things called Easy Bake Ovens, at least our sisters did. And Easy Bake Ovens bake the cake using a light bulb. And the thing is, after the cake was baked, you couldn't get in to eat the cake right away because it cooled down for like 45 minutes so the children wouldn't be burned. And they were awful cakes. They didn't taste good. Nobody liked them. And so I just always think to myself, okay, Gordon Ramsay, the judge, can you imagine a four-year-old baking an easy-bake oven cake and presenting it to Gordon Ramsay on MasterChef season 12? That poor little kid is just going to get slaughtered verbally. Rightfully so. It's a judge. And he's judging. And then you think, okay, I move over here to a different scenario. It's the same cake. It's the same kid. It's the same person who's judging, except now we have Gordon Ramsay, and it's his daughter who's baking him a cake out of the Easy Bake Oven cake for his birthday. And what does he do then? He said, thank you. It's the best cake ever, and he eats it, right? Because he's not the judge, 
Everything else is the same. He's the Father. And therefore, when you come to my office, and you probably do the same thing uh, on your refrigerator, I have pictures that children from Bethlehem Bible Church have drawn of me, and they give them to me after the church service. And by the way, they're horrible. I don't look like that. I look much better, although they make me look pretty skinny with their stick figures. And so I think, oh, that's good. And why do I accept them? Because I accept the child, right? And it's the same thing. While God's law is holy and just and unchanging, our relationship changes because of the work of the triune God. And because we have an advocate, God is no longer judged to us because the judgment has taken, been taken care of at Calvary, right? It's not propitiation made possible, redemption possible, reconciliation possible. It was actually done. He made propitiation. The wrath of God was assuaged, right? All other gods, you have to make propitiation. You have to assuage the wrath of those gods with virgins, with people, with fruit, with grapes, with other things, right? Grains. In Christianity, only Christianity, God makes propitiation, right? And when you read 1 John chapter 4, when he talks about propitiation, he talks about the love of God. And when he talks about the love of God, he talks about propitiation. They're the same kind of concept. Because of the love of God, the, the Son propitiates the wrath of the Father in our place. And so therefore now, instead of being judged, that judgment's already taken place in Christ, we're now having a relationship to God as Father. And therefore, he accepts us, and he, as Calvin would say, and you should read Calvin's Institutes for this, he accepts our less than good works. Lots of times I deal with people, and they're thinking, you know what, I don't teach as well as I should, and I'm not really... And it's very important to realize all of our works are less than good. All of our works, no matter how great you think you are, no matter how godly you think you are, they're less than good because they come from you and you have a sinful nature. So they are corrupted by that nature. They're tainted by sin in some way, shape, or form, by questionable motives. Whatever the issue is, they are tainted. They are All of our good works is nothing but filthy rags before a holy God. They are accepted because of, of Christ Jesus. That's the only reason. And the only reason anything that we are accepted is because of Christ Jesus. So we, we that's why that's why I think it's ridiculous to try to look to your good works to prove that you're saved because you're looking to tainted less than good works. The, your works are not good, they are tainted, they're filthy rags. So, all right, this is all good review. There's a lot we could say there. I think that is a, a, a kind of a cool illustration that, that we had, a, in a sense, uh, our our relationship to God was he was judged, but in Christ Jesus and because of salvation, we now, he is not judged because all all of our sins have already been judged. Now he is father and we are accepted because of Christ Jesus and because all of our sins have been paid for in the imputed righteousness of Christ. All right. I think that's good. Let's see where else he's going to go. Good serving behind the scenes. And I'm not sure about this, that, or the other, but dear Christian friend, God will accept those works because he accepts you. In Christ, he accepts you. And so we're free, and I don't want you to fail. I don't want you to sin. But instead of being paralyzed with, I don't know what to do because I'm not going to be able to give this great God the right kind of alms, the right kind of giving, the right kind of ministry, just do the best you can because God accepts you and he'll accept your works because he accepts you. Does that make sense? And by the way, isn't that good? So freeing. I think, okay, I'm going to offer these things unto the Lord. Yes, I'd like to do the best I can, but... If I fail, I fail. I mean, uh, I'll give you an illustration. I remember Kim and I were going down to Burbank uh, from Santa Cruz a few years ago, and I was to teach a marriage conference. And by the way, those are my all-time worst conferences to teach, especially when my wife is sitting in the front row. <laughs> like, oh, why? Why would anybody want me to do a marriage conference? And so we're driving down to Burbank, California, getting in a huge fight on the way down to the conference. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> why? <laughs> And I think, okay, Kim, please forgive me. You know, we need to make this right. And then I think to myself, uh, I'm going to teach the Bible to these dear people at Calvary Church in Burbank, and I'm going to do the best I can and offer this to the Lord. And since he accepts me, he accepts my works, and feeble though they may be and sinful as I may be, um, I know I have God as a father now. And wouldn't it be best? Again, I know this blows up the template. 
is to show up at the conference. Now, you would obviously have to get approval from your wife to do this, but say, hey, if, if you're going to be uncomfortable, you stay at the hotel, but I'm going to go up there and I'm going to just tell them that on the way here, we had a fight and I'm going to talk about what I did wrong. And I'm just going to be, I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay it out there. Like, I'm just going to say it. Now, your wife may say, absolutely not. I don't want you to do that. And, and I could understand why, but wouldn't it be to me better that, that sometimes that's what's missing in church. We can't be what we are. We have to be something we're not. We can't be, we're all sinners. The, the preacher who's supposed to preach the marriage conference is having World War III with his wife on the way to the conference because we're sinners. The, the, the man teaching a conference about not how to have lust or not to have problems with whatever probably has problems with lust and whatever. Sometimes it would, but we always have to put forth the idea that we've got it figured out. We've got it all together. And now listen to me because I'm the expert. No, the, the, the expert is God. The truth is his word. It's just fallible, sinful people who have to preach it because, well, there any, uh, there's not any other option. You're going to have fallible sinners preaching. I'm a fallible sinner in front of a microphone. I try to say that all the time. And I don't say that out of some f- fake, fraudulent humility. I say that because it's absolute truth. I am an absolute mess and a train wreck. I am garbage. I'm a sinner. That's not, that's just the reality of it. Doesn't excuse the sin, but that's the reality of it. I'm a sinner, right? I'm a sinner. I I talked about it this morning on Philippians, dealing with Philippians or or whichever day it was that I was dealing with Philippians 4.8, not this morning, yesterday, I believe, on Philippians 4.8, that I don't think about those things the way it says. I think about wrong things all the time. So, because it's just the reality but uh, so many times in church we can't, and I think I think if we were we were better with law and gospel, we could just be honest that hey, we're sinners. The only reason any of us are here is because of the gospel. But somehow we want we want to think that no 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 no, and and I know it has to work a certain way because if the preacher does this or this or this or this, he's done, he's disqualified, he's finished. Let's get the next person who can pretend to be righteous. Now pastors will say, well, I'm a sinner just like you, and everybody's like, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, you're a sinner. But as soon as a certain sin shows up, well, then all of a sudden now let's crucify him. Well, wait a minute, I thought I thought you understood that he was a sinner. Well, I'm no, I know he's a sinner, but he's he can he can commit these sins, but these sins he can't commit. Well, how does that work? Okay. Everyone's a sinner in in the scenario. Law and gospel says the law shows us that we're sinners. And the only reason we have any hope is because of the gospel. I just, I just wish that that would free us, that somehow we could be more real and more transparent. But I know, I know there's limits to it, obviously, but I just think it creates an environment where we have to be something. And so to me, like law and gospel would say, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to tell these people the truth. I I I I I every every principle that I'm getting ready to teach you, I failed on the way to this marriage conference because I I got into a knockdown drag out with my wife. I said things that were absolutely horrible, absolutely horrific. They were sinful and they were ungodly. And that's the person who's getting ready to teach you. <laughs> you probably would get inv- you probably wouldn't get invited back and not as a judge. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more today. Before I get into the particular sub-point today, I want to talk about something that I mentioned yesterday, but I want to give you some theological terms to it. I want to talk about duplex gratia today. Duplex gratia, since I do want to honor R.C. Sproul, I'm going to write these two Latin words up here just for fun so you can get an R.C. moment. Du Plex, right, when you're, when you're going to buy a house, my dad said, if you're a smart young man, you'll buy a duplex, and you'll live in one side, you'll run out the other side, eventually you'll own it, and then you'll be set. And so I did not take my dad's advice, but I could have been a million dollars richer. Duplex, two, and then gratia. If I could probably condense this entire seminar into... One word, it would be Jesus, because we're good at law. It's built in. Uh, Law is inside of us. Law is all around us. Uh, But we're not so good at 
the gospel because it has to be from an outside source. So I would probably say Jesus. If I had two words to describe the conference, it would be duplex gratia. So I want to talk about that a little bit now. Duplex gratia. Duplex gratia. What do you think that that means? Gratia, you probably have a good idea. Duplex, possibly, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe. Because it's on the gospel side of the law gospel distinction. And duplex gratia is basically a double grace. Most of you know this, but it's good just to get it into your brain because our default is always just law. And so I want to make sure I re- Double grace. You may want to write that down. Double grace. I'm, I am curious where this is going. I am, I am curious. Let's, let's, let's listen. Enforce duplex gratia. So when you teach your children at the dinner table, you're thinking duplex gratia. When you need a new name for a band that Steve Meisters are going to play in, it's duplex gratia. <laughs> if you have a dog, I always wanted to name my dog like Elvis or something. You just name the dog duplex gratia. Uh, one guy said, by the way, they said, you know, you sometimes name your dog Hitler, but you never name your dog Judas. I'm like, wow. I met a guy once, he had Doberman, and he was an un- unbeliever, and he named his dog Diabolos. Who does that? And then he got saved, and so he changed the name to Gabriel. I thought, okay. I used to ride a horse named uh, Diablo uh, for the devil, right? Uh, that's the horse I used to ride all the time. Um, I can't remember the, the full Spanish name, but it was something Diablo. It was like Streak of Diablo, Lightning of Diablo, uh, something along those lines. I can't remember the full, full thing. That's the horse I always rode when I was a teenager and lived on a big, big ranch uh, when I wasn't living with my family. And uh, I would hop on Diablo. And well, so I, I guess a lot of people do that. Naming your, do- uh, your dog Diablo, I guess that, that's pretty cool. I don't know why you would change the name when you got saved. I mean, like, I, that makes no sense, but okay. Okay, good. <laughs> Works out. The dog didn't know the difference. So I want you to remember duplex gratia, and it's double grace, right? Gracias, grace. You can see the root word there with the G-R-I, and this is going to be Christ for us. That's the first grace, justification. He's for us, in our place, on our behalf, in our stead. His righteousness for ours, our sin to his account. That's Christ. He's Christ for us. And then the second one that's neglected when we teach the Bible in Sunday school sometimes, when we teach some VBS classes, it's Christ in us, sanctification. Okay, so double grace is grace in justification, grace in sanctification. Now, he has taught, he has taught, if I remember correctly in, in our review of all of this, a monergistic sanctification. He seems to reject a synergistic sanctification. Now, monergistic sanctification would raise countless number of questions. And I, if I remember correctly, he kind of taught a monergistic, and then he seemed, to argue, he seemed to say something that was completely contradictory to it. All right, so the, I, we, we understand grace and justification. We understand grace and justification. How do we understand? It, let's set aside monergistic or synergistic. Let's set that aside. How do we understand grace and sanctification? That I think that is a very important topic. How do we understand grace and sin? We understand justification, right? We, I mean, that we, we should have that down completely. But when it comes to sanctification, how do we see grace and sanctification? All right, let's, let's see. I think sometimes we can forget. Yes, Jesus did in fact die for our sins, uh, to get us into heaven, but now what about uh, rules and law for daily living now? J.C. Ryle said, He who supposes that Jesus Christ only lived and died and rose again in order to provide justification has much yet to learn. Whether he knows it or not, he is dishonoring our blessed Lord and making him only half a savior. The Lord Jesus has undertaken everything that his people's souls require not only to deliver them from their guilt by his atoning death, but from the dominion of their sins by placing in their hearts the Holy Spirit, not only to justify them, but to sanctify them. Oh boy, here we go. Here we go. The never-ending dilemma in Christianity. 
<sighs> I, I grow tired of having to struggle with this, but I am going to continue to struggle with it. That preach is so good, doesn't it? Right? Okay. Christ gave you everything you need for justification, but he's also giving you everything you need for sanctification. He has put the Holy Spirit in you to break the dominion of sin so that you can have freedom over sin so that you can obey. Well, then again, when you say things like that, you got to take them to their logical conclusion. If the Holy Spirit is in me, the dominion of sin has been completely broken. Like that sin no longer has dominion over me. I have been set free practically then you would have to say, you would have to argue, you would have to claim that not only is it possible, it is probable to have sinless Christians because the dominion of sin has been broken. But what they'll see is you have the Holy Spirit in you. He's giving you the strength and the power and everything you need to be godly. The dominion of sin has been broken. And we say that, and then somewhere in the sermon, it'll be like, but read the fine print, you're still going to sin. Well, why am I still going to sin if the Holy Spirit's in me, giving me everything I need to live a godly life and the dominion of sin has been broken? Are you telling me the Holy Spirit can't get me to perfection? And you say, well, no, 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 no. He can, he just doesn't. Well, then if I, listen, if you tell me that I can't stop sinning and I can't be perfect, you can't tell me the dominion of sin over my life has been broken because I'm limited in the amount of godliness or holiness I can reach by sin, meaning there's still dominion there. I don't know how Christians say this stuff with a straight face. You have the power of God. You can overcome sin. You can say yes to God. You can obey. You can say no to sin. You can do this. But, 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 but wait, wait, wait. Come here, come here, come here. Shh. Right. I got I to gotta say this on the down low. See, you're still going to sin. You can't be perfect. You're going to sin all the time. Wait, wait, wait. You just said, I know what I said, but that's for the sermon. But in, 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 in real life, we got we to gotta be real, right? I mean, that's just what we sell. That's just the info commercial. In real life, we know this church is a mess. Everyone in this church is sinning. I'm sinning. Everyone, the people in the choir are sinning. People in the nursery are sinning. People in the youth group are sinning. There's sin all over this congregation. But shh, keep it down to down. We sell it like, we have the power of God. The dominion of sin has been broken. But shh. That's only what we, that's what we put in the commercial. Come on, we all know. We all know that we're trash, right? We all, we, we all know that, right? I don't understand how Christians don't see the complete duplicity, contradiction, and confusion that that seems to create. On one hand, I'm being told, you can do it. On the other hand, I'm being told, but you won't. But you can, but you won't. But you should, but you don't. Hey, but but sanctification is all the work of God. Well, well, well then, then, if, then for every lack of sanctification in my life, it's God's fault, right? It's not my fault. God didn't sanctify me. Oh, no, no, you can't say that. Well, wait a minute. You just said it was monergistic. How do Christians, I don't understand how Christians don't know how this just, we make these claims that there is nothing in reality that supports the claim positionally, the dominion of sin is gone. Positionally, I'm a new creature and the old is gone. Positionally, it's all true. Practically, sin nature still inside of me, still, still a sinner, still will continue to be a sinner and will continue to sin until I am dead and I have a new body with no longer a sinful nature. You've got to preach that reality. The double grace. And by the way, if you weren't here yesterday, you write me at nocompromiseradio.com, Mike at nocompromise. I'll send you my notes. Uh, I'll just send you a bunch of Word documents. That's a lot of cutting and pasting, not much original stuff. Don't tell me the formatting's bad. Just respond with thank you. No, just kidding. <laughs> That's the New Englander in me. I'm like, okay, what are you doing? I met a guy the other day from New England uh, in Santa Cruz, and I thought, you're my kind of people, just direct, just blunt. I always tell people, I can't be a pastor in California or the South because I would have got kicked out a long time ago because I'm ornery. And compared to New Englanders, though, they think I'm nice, so it works out just perfectly. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews 8, and I want to show you this double grace. Hebrews, of course, is a sermon, and it's an epistle. It's a sermonic epistle or an epistolatory sermon, however you want to say it. And if you read it out loud, it'll probably take you about 45 minutes to do so.
Okay. Oh, boy. Hebrews 8. I am so worried where this is going. All right. So this double grace, and it sounds like what he's saying is grace and justification, God takes care of everything. Grace and sanctification, in theory, supposed to take care of everything. Sin, the dominion of sin is gone, and now because of God's grace, I can be holy and I can be righteous. But 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 I'm still going to sin. Well, that doesn't sound like that. That the grace and sanctification really does its job. It seems like there's a limit in what grace and sanctification can actually accomplish. It cannot get me to sinless perfection. Therefore, it's limited in its power. It's limited in its scope. It's limited in what it accomplishes. We've got to deal with that limit that it has so that we can understand how to live our Christian life because the way it's sold is that you should be able to, well, then why do we keep sinning? This is what leads to utter discouragement, despondency, depression, and deconstruction because you're just like, this This is garbage. You, you guys sell this stuff and it doesn't work. Or you have to start living in some land of denial where you pretend to be more godly than you are. That's why I talked about that, that law and gospel should lead us to being the most honest and transparent people on earth because we're like, man, you're messed up. I'm messed up. Oh, you commit that sin. I've committed that sin. Oh, you, whenever, whenever someone fi- has found out in the church that they commit that sin, you're like, look, I've committed worse. Okay. You just, I didn't get caught. You say, so you're saying celebrate sin and excuse it? No, I'm saying that's the reality of Christianity and it has been for 2000 years. All right, Hebrews 8. Oh, boy. I, I don't know where this is going to go. I, I am so worried. All right, let, let's just see. Let's see where this is going to go. And if I was on the, um, in some tribe in uh, some Hindu nation, I didn't know what to say or what to do because I hadn't been trained to preach. And it was the Lord's Day. I didn't know what to do. I would just simply open up the book of Hebrews and read this sermon. The only sermon to an existing church in the New Testament Right, we have Paul talking and Peter talking and preaching in Acts, uh, but they're more open air and evangelistic. And here this is to a group of people that are suffering and they're losing their homes and probably their lives eventually, many of them. And so what do you write to these people? And he writes to them. Just make sure you understand, I believe the hermeneutical key to Hebrews that always gets left out, it's written to Jews right before 70 A.D., So their religion, everything about Judaism is about to be completely wiped off the face of the earth. No more temple, no more sacrifice, no more high priest, no more anything. Gone. That's the way it has to be interpreted. I stand by that and I, and I will, I will die fighting for that concept. Everyone seems to agree on the dating of the book. Everyone seems to agree it's written to, to Jews. So if it's written to the Jews right before 70 AD, I, I think then it, it takes on a whole easy way to understand. But all right, let's continue. About the Lord Jesus. That's what he's doing. And in chapter one, he's talking about the Lord Jesus from Psalms that you'd never think Jesus was in per se. Uh, you think, oh yeah, Messianic Psalm chapter two, Messianic Psalm chapter 110, Messianic Psalm 89. But all of a sudden you think Psalm 102, that's Jesus, Elohim the Son. And so he just is extolling who Jesus is, and he's warning people that are kind of looky loos if you will, that uh, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, and you can't you know, escape uh, uh, if you're going to neglect this great salvation. And if you come to chapter 8, uh, I, I love this duplex gratia that we see here. And by the way, it was John Calvin who first probably articulated these dual graces of justification and sanctification that both flow from our union with Christ. Hebrews 8.10. Look and see if you can find the double grace here. For this is the covenant, Hebrews 8.10, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and will remember their sins no more. Now it's not Christ for us to start and Christ in us. He switches it, but if you want to have Christ for us, look at verse 12. Sins not remembered 
and merciful toward their iniquities. That is Christ for us. That's justification. Our sins are gone. They're not remembered. By the way, I long for heaven for lots of reasons. And one of the reasons I'm going to love heaven is I don't have to have those recurring forgiven sins coming up in my mind that are in the skeletons of my uh, deepest memories that I don't want there anymore. It would be kind of nice. I always think to myself, if somebody put me on a lie detector test and asked me about all those secret sins, the shame and the guilt, I would hate people to know that. And of course, I'm not going to have to deal with that because the Lord has taken care of those. But in heaven, I don't have to do any of that. Isn't that going to be good? By the way, if you like studying the doctrine of God now, think how great it's going to be in heaven. Everything's going to... Did you have a question or you just... You're, that's an amen. Okay. In heaven, you never are going to forget anything about God that you've learned. That's one of my problems. If you ask me, you'll say, well, what do you think about the federal vision controversy? I think, well, I just don't like it. Why don't you like it? I forgot, but I remember I studied it before. <laughs> I'll get back to you. <laughs> and in heaven, we're never going to have to well, deal with air, but you, you, you're, you'll always remember what you're supposed to remember, and you'll always be learning. Right? We're still going to be finite in heaven, and God's infinite. So learning, learning, learning. And that's one of the wonderful things about being a Christian. We now love to learn. Oh, you learn something new about who God is and, and what he's doing. You think, oh, I love to learn about God. And so we get to do that in heaven over and over and over. So Christ for us is found in verse 12, and Christ in us is found in verse 10. I'll put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. Calvin said, by partaking of him, we principally receive a double grace, duplex gratia, reconciliation to God through Christ's blamelessness, that we may have in heaven a gracious father instead of a judge, and secondly, sanctified by Christ's spirit, we may cultivate blamelessness and purity of life. So we have... Oh boy. Okay. So this, man, this gets into a lot of issues. I will, I'm going to make a claim here. Now, uh, I have to go back. This has been a long time. It's, it's been a couple of years now, more than a couple of years. We did a long, long, long discussion about the new covenant. If you go to the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah, where the new covenant is promised, the new covenant is promised to the house of Israel, to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I mean, the, the terminology is explicit, right? It, the new covenant is with Israel and with Judah. In other words, he uses the divided kingdom language, but saying it's made with both, right? Which would seem to infer that they will be regathered. Now, I know the theological solutions to this. Well, it says house of Israel and house of Judah, but that it doesn't really mean Israel and Judah. See, that's the term. That's for spiritual Israel. It's for the church. See, the new covenant's for the church. Israel's been replaced by the church. Well, I reject that outright. One, if you go through and just look up the term Israel, Israel, Judah, Judah, Israel, 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 Judah, it's always referring to the nation over and over and over and over and over again. And we went through, we looked up what, like 3,000 references as a church. We went through every reference of the term and like this, there's, why would we change the meaning here, right? And, and now I understand there's a couple of New Testament passages where you're like, well, maybe but I'm talking over and over and over and over. That it's referring to the nation. So the covenant's made with Israel, and I think that that covenant is made, and they will be restored. They will be regathered. They will be restored, and all Israel will be saved, as mentioned in the book of Romans. I don't believe that's referring to the church or spiritual Israel. I believe God made promises to the nation of Israel, and he will keep those promises because his calling and election is sure. He does not cast them aside. If he, if he doesn't keep his promises to Israel, then he doesn't keep our promises to us, or he wouldn't have to. Just so many issues there. So when I read this, and remember, this is written to the Jews. Leading up to the fast approaching 70 AD, he says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel for those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law into their minds and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. That is a reference back to Jeremiah, to the promise of the covenant, which was made to Israel. Right? And if you say, well, no, this is for us. See, God is going to write in our minds, he's going he's gonna to put the laws in our minds. He's going to put them in our hearts and he's going to be to us a God and he shall be a people. That is for us. Well, then the next part, well, then they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Well, then you're saying that as Christians, we don't need to be taught. You say, well, no, no, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. 
So, so, so we say Israel isn't Israel, Judah isn't Judah. That's us. That's the Christians. That's the church. It's not for Israel. And those promises just means that he's going to put the law there. But then we say he's going to put the law in us and grace in us so that we can be blameless and have purity of life. Well, how can I be blameless and have purity of life when there's constant sin in my life? I think this is first and foremost re- reminding Israel that no matter what's about to happen, no matter if if the, the, the temple and everything is destroyed, I have made a covenant with you and I will do this. I will keep this promise. And we and, and I believe this is why I tend to move away from more of the amillennial approach, because I just don't believe the church has been replaced. I don't believe that Israel's been replaced by the church. I don't believe I'm in the millennial kingdom now. I believe Israel will have to be regathered, will have to be restored, they will be saved, and the promises will be given to them. They will all be saved. And they will be with Christ in the millennial kingdom. And all the promises to Israel will be granted. The land promises and everything will be given. You say, well, I, I reject that. Well, look, you reject it. And, and, and it's just weird how people get so upset about that. Like, you're dispensationalist. And just stop with the theological terms. Either God keeps his promises or don't. It seems weird to me to say, hey, they lose their promises because they're unfaithful. I get all of their promises even though I'm unfaithful. If Israel's going to be cast aside for their unfaithfulness, show me in 2,000 years of church history how we're any better than Israel. Let's continue. Justification and inner renewal, and both are works of God that we learned last night. Sanctification is a work of God. And you think, well, I, I know this to be true, so why are you even harping on it? I just want to make you maybe thankful that you sit underneath Christ-centered preaching, triune God preaching, because it's not that that popular. Uh, It doesn't pack the seats. Uh, And so if you have a pastor, if you're here, you do have two pastors. And if you're at a different church and you have a pastor that will tell you about the Lord Jesus as a Christian so that you can say no to sin and yes to righteousness, I mean, how happy can you be? Right? I think to myself, I've got many faults, but I don't. Hey, be thankful that your pastor will tell you that you can say no to sin and yes to God. Well, then then as a pastor, I'd be like, hey, guys, you can say no to sin and yes to God. This church better be perfect because you can say no to what is I don't even understand how this has anything to do with law and gospel, because why do we need a distinction between law and gospel? Because we can be perfect. So the good news in this conference on law and gospel is that now as a Christian, you can say no to sin and yes to God. What a great, that, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I can, now, everyone go do it. Now, I, I would challenge you, go find all the people at that conference. Go find the people who preach at that conference. Look at their lives. If they can say no to sin and yes to God, why aren't they perfect? You say, well, it, it, it doesn't mean you can do it all the time. Then you've got to, then if I can't do it all the time, then it doesn't mean I can say no to, you can't tell me you can say no to sin. Well, not perfectly. You can say yes to God, but not all the time. That's the most ridiculous, contradictory thing I've ever heard in my life. Either I can or I can't. You say, well, I can sometimes. Well, if you can sometimes, why not all the time? And if you can't all the time, then that means you can't say no to all sin. And how, how frequently do you sin? Love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. You f- fall short of that every day. Love your neighbor as yourself. You fall short of that every day. Um, think, uh, you see, uh, uh, be pure in heart. You fall short of that in every day. Be holy as God is holy. You fall short of that every day. So how are you doing? How are you doing on, on your, your ability to say no to sin and yes to God? You, you, are, you fall short. All right, we're going to stop here with the 23-minute mark. 23 minutes. We didn't get far. We didn't get far, but that's okay. We will return to this this evening at some point, at some point, uh, because I'm going to have uh, food is probably on its way here now. So I'll have an early dinner. And then I'll give it about an hour, hour and a half. So probably around, hopefully maybe around 5.30, maybe, maybe around 6. 
but we can finish this, and we'll finish this tonight, and uh, hopefully you'll find it to be beneficial and helpful. I know we talked about a lot of things in that audio. I could have just been quiet, not mentioned those things. Sometimes I kick myself after, but the, the whole, I mean, that's the way I do the reviews, whether people like the way I do them or not. I don't listen to them in, in, in advance, so my reactions are real and organic, and I know sometimes I'll get an email, why did you waste time talking about that? Because it's what I thought when I was listening, so <laughs> sorry, okay, but um, that's the way it works. Man, double, so duplex gratia, do, do we go with that idea? Is there a double grace? Is there a double grace? Is there a double grace? I think most of you would say yes. I struggle with that. Because if the grace works the way he's describing, then now I can say no to sin. I can say yes to God. I don't really need anyone to teach me because I have all of God's law written on in my heart, my mind, and and I guess I'm good to go. But I, I just see too much sin in the life of, of believers to say that that's the way it works. I do believe there's grace and sanctification, and that grace is to constantly bring forgiveness. I think there is grace and, and sanctification. We need grace because we fall short every single day in our sanctification. We never accomplish it. We fall short, we fall short, we fall short. We, because in sanctification, what are you doing? You're trying to live out. You're trying to keep, well, the law. Isn't that what you're trying to do in sanctification? You're trying to obey God. You're trying to obey God. And guess what you're going to do every day in sanctification? Fall short. So there is a grace in sanctification. <laughs> it's for called forgiveness because we fall short. He's saying the grace is now you have the ability to do it. I, I, I don't, how is that Grace. It's not grace because if we, because clearly we don't have the ability. Oh man, so many questions. I have so many questions here. All right, we'll let him finish that up coming up in about an hour, hour and a half. You can email me in the meantime, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. This is sure to be controversial, but I hope you're listening. Just just look at the reality of your own life. That's all you have to do. Just, Just be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Don't don't play the pretend church game. Be honest, and I think you'll you'll understand what I'm saying. All right, thanks for listening. Everyone have a great evening. God bless.